Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on electrostatics. This is video number 26, and I'm going to discuss the electrostatic boundary conditions. There are many videos previous to this which are relevant in one form or another, and I've listed some of them on the left-hand side of your screen. So the electrostatic boundary conditions are very important in many ways. If you're studying optics, for example, it's these boundary conditions which allow you to drive the Fresnel equations, the laws of reflection and refraction, and so on. So they're very important in many respects. They are the fundamentals, or the, the, yeah, the fundamentals of geometrical optics. So first of all, let's summarize what we've seen up to date. If you want to convert, or if you want to find out what the, the uh, charge density is, if we have the electric potential, we need to use the Poisson's equation. So Poisson's equation says if you take the Laplacian of the potential, it's equal to rho over epsilon zero. And if in instead you're going from charge density to electric potential, you use 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, the integral of the charge density integrated over the volume divided by the magnitude of the separation vector. So if you would then instead have the, uh, you have the charge density and you're looking to calculate the electric field, well, you perform a similar integral, which is here. And instead, if you have the electric field and you want to calculate the charge density, you, you apply Gauss's law in differential form instead. So this here is Gauss's law in differential form. We, have, we had Gauss's law in integral form a moment ago. Now, the other thing we can use is the fact that the curl of the electrostatic field is zero, and that's very important as well. Finally then, if you want to go between the electric field and the electric potential and back again, we can use that the potential is minus the integral of e dot dl, or that the, the, the field is minus the gradient of the, uh, the scalar potential. So these six equations allow us to derive the electrostatic boundary conditions and they are essentially the fundamentals of your electrostatics. So where do we go from here? Well, what we're going to try and first of all look at is the electric field perpendicular to an interface. So let's say we have some sort of a conducting interface which I've drawn, the outline of which I've drawn in orange. Now, the way you do this is you use Gauss's law. And Gauss's law requires you to use some form of a Gaussian surface. So for a flat surface like this, or um, a thin surface like this, you would use what's known as a Gaussian pillbox. So what we're trying to do is work out what exactly happens to the electric field when it's moving perpendicular to the electric field, or excuse me, perpendicular to the interface, so when it is normal to the interface. So of course we're going to have two components. We're going to have a component above the interface and a, a component below the interface. So I'm going to call them E perpendicular up or E perpendicular down. So now we need to, to, to draw our Gaussian pillbox. So in the solid purple lines I've drawn the Gaussian pillbox on the upside or the top side of the, uh, of the interface. And the broken lines are the Gaussian pillbox or uh, below the, uh, the interface itself. The thickness of the pillbox is epsilon. So in order for us to um, get the first electrostatic boundary condition, we need to apply Gauss's law. So I've written Gauss's law on the top right of your screen. So if we take the closed surface integral of E dot dA, it's equal to 1 over epsilon 0, the volume integral of the charge density. Now note that the left hand side is a flux. It's something you should know at this stage. So the net flux is always going to be the difference between what leaves a surface and what enters it. So I define the flux here, capital Phi, as E perpendicular up minus E perpendicular down. So that's the amount at any one point, and of course we need to multiply it by the area of our Gaussian pillbox. So I've done that there. Now what I'm going to do is shrink the thickness of our Gaussian pillbox down to zero. What that will mean is that the sides will not contribute to the electric flux and it'll just be the top and bottom um, of your Gaussian pillbox. So if you look at this, we, we, we perform our integral on the right hand side, what we get is 1 over epsilon 0, the integral of the charge density over the volume. Now because we're no longer talking about a volume, instead we're talking about a surface area, we can integrate 1 over epsilon 0 sigma prime dA prime, giving us of course sigma times the area divided by epsilon 0. Thus what we can say is, in the limit, the flux or E perpendicular up minus E perpendicular down is equal to sigma over epsilon zero because the area components cancel out. 
So what this means is that the perpendicular component of your electric field is discontinuous at a boundary by an amount sigma over epsilon zero. And this is very important and it's something which uh, perhaps isn't very intuitive when you're deriving the Fresnel equations but just go back to your electrostatic boundary conditions and the Fresnel equations just fall out. So now what we need to do is look at the electric field parallel to the interface. So you have a similar setup but this time we're going to draw a, a line integral. So I have a rectangular line integral drawn there on our interface. So it has a length of L on two of the sides and a length of epsilon on uh, the other two sides. I'm sure you can guess what's going to happen. We're going to shrink epsilon down to zero again. So we're going to have a parallel component of the electric field up, which is here, and a parallel component of the electric field down, which is here. So they are on opposite sides or either side uh, of the interface itself. We have, of course, a charge density of sigma. So the divergence theorem says that if we take the surface integral of the curl of the electric field dotted with the infinitesimal area element, it's equal to the closed line integral of E dot dl. Now we know that in electrostatics, the curl of the electric field is zero. What this means is that the closed line integral of E dot dl is also zero. So finally then, when we shrink our one of, the si well, excuse me, one of the sides, or both of the sides, shall we say, of our line integral down to zero by shrinking epsilon to zero, what we get is that E dot dl is E parallel up times L minus E parallel down times L, which of course has to be zero. Since the length is non-zero, this means that E parallel up is equal to E parallel down. Or what we can say is that the electric field component parallel to the interface is in fact continuous. So just to rehab or recap, excuse me, we can say that the perpendicular component of the electric field is discontinuous at a boundary by an amount sigma over epsilon zero but the parallel component is continuous across the boundary. And this is very important. So the summary here is that we have the perpendicular component is discontinuous by an amount sigma over epsilon zero, but the parallel component is in fact continuous. We can conveniently express this by using the normal vector. So if this is our, this, this is our surface, then the normal vector would be perpendicular to our surface like that. So we talk about n hat. And if you want, you can look at my videos on vector calculus for electromagnetism to find more about the normal vector. So the, this particular expression here holds both of our uh, electrostatic boundary conditions. Now we were introduced to the electric potential recently, so we also need to look at the boundary conditions for our electric potential. So the electric potential is minus the integral of E dot dl. So if we're to taking um, two limits, it's going to be, let's say, the potential up and the potential down. And that's going to be the integral of minus a to b e dot dl. So v up minus v down is going to be minus e times b minus e times a. So they are just two particular points on our uh, interface. So in the limit, b minus a is going to be equal to zero. And what that means is that the potential up is equal to the potential down. What we can say is that the electric potential is always going to be continuous. Always, full stop, electric potential is continuous. So we say that the parallel component of the electric field is continuous, the perpendicular component is discontinuous, but that the electric potential is always continuous. So finally then, the electric potential can be written as uh, excuse me, the electric field can be written as minus the gradient of the electric potential. But we saw a moment ago that the electric or the electric field can be written as E up minus E down is sigma over epsilon zero times the normal unit vector. What this means if we take the gradient of our electric potential, that's going to be sigma over epsilon zero times n hat. Or what we can say is that the gradient of the electric field up on your interface minus the gradient, excuse me, the gradient of your potential up minus the gradient of your potential down is going to be minus sigma over epsilon zero n hat. Basically what I'm saying is that the gradient of your electric potential is discontinuous across the boundary. So we say that the electric field perpendicular is discontinuous 
the electric field parallel is continuous, that the electric potential is always continuous, but that the gradient of the electric potential is discontinuous. So that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.